I would hope if nothing else comes through that, you, that by the end of this, you're convinced that one, bee lawns are a fantastic option for your home lawns as a sustainable pollinator friendly solution. And two, that this is something that I am incredibly passionate about. So with that, let's get started. So kind of acknowledging some folks who helped me create this uh, presentation in the first place. So Blue Thumb and Metro Blooms, those are organizations that I've worked with in the past and continue to work with. Uh, Metro Blooms is a great nonprofit that I worked for that actually manages the Blue Thumb Partnership. And the Blue Thumb Partnership is a nonprofit organization. I like to say it's where education meets implementation, where it's a public-private partnership that does lots of educational workshops, just like this one that we're doing today. Um, and also it helps to connect folks with uh, local installation services and plant nurseries and things like that. So this is a Minnesota based organization. So they're not quite local to Michigan, but I still always love to give them a shout out and acknowledge the great work that they do. Uh, Twin City Seed Company, that's the name of the company that I work for. When I was conducting this research, they were the first organization to look at these bee lawns and say, this is a fantastic idea. This is something that we want to make available to the general public. So even while I was a student, we started chatting about how we could make these bee lawns available to everyone. And now I'm working with Twin City Seed to kind of really uh, expand on that goal of making bee lawns something that's not just something that gets published in a research paper, or not even just popular in the state of Minnesota, but really a nation nationwide trend, at least popular in the northern climates where bee lawns are really best suited, at least for the species that I'm working with here. So what I always like to start off with in these bee lawn workshops is a little bit of background information where I don't know where everyone is coming at. Some of you might be lawn experts and bee experts. For some of you, this might be just something that sounded fun to attend. We always like to give a little bit of context such that we're all on the same page. So I'm gonna start off by talking about the cultural and ecological functions of the lawn and kind of how a bee lawn fits within that. Um, after that, I'm gonna talk about the elements of a bee lawn, kind of the different building blocks that go into actually creating a bee lawn. And then we're gonna virtually at least get our hands dirty together and talk about how we can actually go about installing a bee lawn in our own home yards, where something that I love about this is it's so easy to do as a DIY project. I think whether you are a gardening novice or a gardening expert, it's something that you could easily do with do yourself with really not too much work uh, attached. But with that being said, let's start off by talking about the cultural and ecological functions of the lawn. So I think the lawn does get a fair bit of hate, a fair bit of criticism. And I do think some of that is merited, but I also think it's important that we acknowledge the lawn's uh, function, where it is really important that we have some green spaces, some spaces where we can gather and play. And as much as I love a native garden and our uh, prairie remnants that we still have across the country, our beautiful prairies are not a great place to gather and play. I don't think anyone here is gonna go out and play a game of soccer or have a picnic in the middle of a wild flower prairie that's got flowers six, eight feet tall. So I think it's important to acknowledge that the turf grass lawn is a great place for gathering and play. And while maybe this manicured carpet isn't the best thing for our nature, perhaps we can think about how we can enhance the benefits of this landscape form while still maintaining the recreational function that we, uh, that we desire out of the turf lawns. Where a common theme of this bee lawn workshop comes down to a philosophy that we call reconciliation ecology. It's where we acknowledge that humans are a permanent part of our landscapes, and we try to find the middle ground between what nature wants out of a green space and what humans want out of a green space. And I think bee lawns are a really great um, example of a solution that comes out of that philosophy of reconciliation ecology. So that being said, uh, turf grass receives its criticisms, and here are some of those kind of drawbacks associated with the turf grass lawn. And for the most part, these are all due to or attached to what I would call lawn inputs or the management that we have to apply to a turf grass lawn in order for it to look nice and kind of just thrive. So first, let's start with watering. Every time we're wa we water our turf grass lawns, of course, we're expending a valuable natural resource, but we also create this potential for stormwater runoff. I'm sure all of you have seen a neighbor with a sprinkler system where not all of that water is being infiltrated within the turf grass lawn. Some of it is making its way to the sidewalk and potentially even flowing off into the street. Whenever we irrigate, especially when we over irrigate, that overflow, that's, that runoff has the potential to bring nutrients into nearby bodies of water. I know in the state of Minnesota, this is a very big deal. It's the land of 10,000 lakes, but what lots of people don't realize is that more than half of those lakes are 
classified as contaminated. And I don't know the exact stats for Michigan, but I do know that we all want to protect our bodies of water. So if you want to kind of think about a more sustainable solution for reducing stormwater runoff, I'll talk about how bee lawns can uh, play a role there. But it is important to remember that when we water excessively, we're really at a huge risk for stormwater runoff, or excuse me, for water runoff. Um, also issues associated with the use of fertilizer. When we fertilize, we're putting nutrients, primarily nitrogen and phosphorus into our lawn. And when we get a rain event or, or if we were to overwater, those nutrients can uh, come off as stormwater runoff and reach those bodies of water. One that most people are very well aware of are the issues associated with mowing, where we're expending fossil fuels every time we mow. It's really unbelievable just how much fossil fuels get burnt each time we do a mowing event. So trying to use grass species that grow more slowly, require fewer mowings, can really help out there. And I'll talk more about that as we go on in this presentation. So thinking about those inputs, those are something that folks have been talking about for the last 10, 20 years when it comes to turf grass management and looking at turf grass through a lens of sustainability. That last bullet point is really something a little bit more novel that our traditional turf grass lawns, for the most part, lack ecological function. And really one of the goals of these bee lawns, probably the primary goal, at least from my point of view as an entomologist and a uh, bee conservationist, is that we wanna bring back the pollinators, the insects and the wildlife to our own home lawns. So turf lawns are incredibly prominent in the United States. When we think of areas where turf grass lawns are most prevalent, we probably think of our major metro areas somewhere like the urban and suburban areas of like a New York City, perhaps, or a Southern California, but even my home twin cities in Minnesota and some areas throughout Michigan as well, you can see those big patches of green on that image that I've posted to your screen. Those areas all represent spaces where we see lots and lots of turf grass, about 50,000 miles in the continental US. And to kind of give you a frame of reference there, that's more than three times the acreage that we have of irrigated corn in the US. So when we're thinking about our most prominent irrigated crops, turf grass is way high up there. And while there are many issues associated with this, there's also a ton of opportunity where the vast majority of land in the United States is privately owned, especially where we have turf grass lawns. And that means that we all have this incredible opportunity to more sustainably manage a landscape feature that is very uh, common and prominent throughout the United States. So our solution for this kind of turf grass issue is bee lawns, where we wanna take that traditional turf grass lawn, add in some low growing bee friendly forage and create what we call a flowering lawn or a bee lawn or a pollinator lawn, where really what we're trying to do is encourage pollinators in a turf grass setting. So we're maintaining that recreation and function associated with the traditional turf grass lawn, while also introducing those low growing flowers that provide forage for our pollinators, very much in line with this theme of reconciliation ecology. So there are a few goals that I want you to have in your mind as to what does a bee lawn accomplish? One, that they're low maintenance, two, that they protect pollinators, and three, that they can help improve local water quality. So when I say low maintenance or low input, it's really these first three bullet points on this slide that I want you all to focus on. When I look at a low input or low maintenance lawn, I want us to be thinking about drought tolerance. The more drought tolerant a vegetation cover is, the less water you need to apply to it. Uh, we also look for a slow vertical growth rate. The more slowly a vegetation grows, the less frequently we have to mow it, particularly particularly in the case of a turf grass lawn. So slow vertical growth rate, very sustainable. And also we want a vegetation, a turf grass species that has low fertility needs. The less we fertilize, the less those nutrients will run off. Uh, disease resistance and insect resistance, those are things that are really more applicable to our turf grass breeding programs, where they want turf grasses that aren't as susceptible to things like uh, dollar spot and snow mold. So really not of interest to you. And note that when we say insect resistance, we're really referring to grubs, we are not referring to pollinators, where I'm sure that at least some of you in this audience have had issues with grubs in your lawn. So our turf grass breeders are trying to create low input lawns that naturally resist grubs. So pollinator protection, the second goal of these bee lawns. I hope this is pretty obvious, but we're bringing in these uh, low growing flowers for the specific goal of providing forage, providing support to our pollinator species. This is just a small example of some of the pollinators that I actually observed in my research. 
either myself or a research technician took all of the photos that you'll see here today um, of the pollinators, some of these Minnesota friends that we've got here, an agapostum on the left, an agochlorella in the middle, and a beautiful bumblebee on the right. Those are the Latin names for just two sweat bees and a bumblebee. I just love to show off the beautiful metallic green colors. Uh, I'm sure as Michigan State fans, seeing some nice beautiful green is a uh, very common place for you, or I know that's part of the school colors. So the one that I think is least obvious is how bee lawns can play a role in stormwater conservation. And I would hope the first thing that jumps off the screen of, for you at this picture is that is not what I expected a bee lawn to look like. And you would be absolutely right, where what we've got here is a rain garden where without fail, uh, before this, I did lots of landscape design work. And whenever someone told me that the goal for their area was to reduce stormwater runoff, without fail, the first recommendation that I would always make is to site a rain garden. And a rain garden is fantastic for capturing stormwater runoff. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that even a very large rain garden in a residential property is likely only going to cover about two, maybe 300 square feet, maybe a bit larger than that, and that they are also very ex expensive to install. And the same goes for when I'm doing a more professional design where that previous slide was kind of just like what I would call like a back of the napkin drawing. But even when we would do these professional renderings, we would do everything we could to map how water moves through the property, site the rain garden appropriately and catch as much stormwater as we could. But even when we're doing these kind of back of the napkin drawings or the professional renderings, Something that I think we have to acknowledge is there's so much space that we're not considering outside of the rain garden. And where I think these bee lawns play and can play an incredible role is in supplementing our rain gardens and native plantings, where um, even when those rain gardens are covering a couple hundred square foot, a bee lawn is a fantastic option for the rest of those thousands, possibly square feet, where we want to reduce stormwater runoff. And how bee lawns help out there is your typical turf grass lawns which are generally planted with Kentucky bluegrass, um, have root systems that are maybe four, five, six inches deep. With Kentucky bluegrass, generally what you see above the ground is very similar to what you see below the ground. So they're not great in terms of their ability to infiltrate stormwater. The species used in the bee lawn mix, even the turf grasses, have root systems that are a couple feet deep, sometimes deeper than that. So if we're thinking about how much stormwater can each of these surfaces uh, infiltrate, a Kentucky bluegrass lawn versus a bee lawn, those bee lawns are able to infiltrate far, far, far more stormwater runoff than their Kentucky bluegrass counterparts. So I think a bee lawn is a fantastic supplement to a rain garden through that lens of stormwater conservation. So I hope this kind of got everyone on the same page in terms of what role, what's, what, does, what is the role that our lawns play in society? Um, what are some of the benefits and drawbacks of our lawns? And where can we see a bee lawn playing a role in bettering our world for sustainability and for our pollinators? What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna kind of take you through the story of how we built the bee lawn and understanding, excuse me, and understanding what species we use within these bee lawns and why we use them. So for these bee lawns, we quite literally built them from the bottom up. And for these next few slides, I'm gonna talk a lot about the research of a student who came before me. His name is Ian Lane. He is an incredible person and honestly a research mentor for myself. And he covered those first two bullet points, figuring out what turf grass species would work really nicely within the context of a bee lawn, and also figuring out what flowers would work really nicely within the context of a bee lawn. I came in at the end of that second bullet point, but it's really a lot of Ian's research that I'll be talking about there. And then finally, the last part, who actually visits a bee lawn? What bees do we actually see within these landscapes? That's what the, the focus of my uh, master's work was on. And I think it's really exciting and fun to share. If you can't tell by now, I really love talking about bees and ways we can protect them. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about the turf grass species that work for a bee lawn and how we kind of figured out which species we wanted to use. So here I do want to acknowledge at least some of the benefits of our turf grass lawns and kind of how we can amplify these benefits. So first, I think that first bullet point is po quite possibly the most important bullet point on this slide, where they prevent soil erosion. So I talked a little bit about stormwater runoff. Um, a great way you can reduce stormwater runoff is just having some form of vegetative covering. Whenever I do a site assessment in an area that has lawn planted, the biggest red flag that can that can uh, that I can raise is when I see bare soil. Bare soil has a very small ability to prevent soil erosion. 
um, it's really just fully exposed and ready to run off the surface. So what's great about turf grass is it forms this very dense coverage, almost like a carpet of sorts, that really helps prevent soil erosion and stabilize dust. Um, our turf grass lawns, like many other green surfaces, green plantings, release oxygen into the atmosphere and sequester carbon. There's also some human focused benefits here, like the moderation of air temperature. I'm sure all of you or most of you have heard of the urban heat island effect, where when we have impervious surfaces in our urban centers, those areas tend to be hotter. Even putting in turf grass helps to combat that urban heat island effect and even reducing noise. So what we can do to kind of amplify those benefits of a turf grass lawn is place an emphasis on using low maintenance species. So we're looking for species with drought tolerance, species with a slow vertical growth rate, and species with low fertility needs when we're trying to think of what is the most low maintenance or low input turf grass species and a great candidate for a bee lawn. And ultimately what we decided on were the fine fescue grasses where these are the ideal candidates for a low input lawn. And the reason for that is it has all of those uh, qualities that we look for in a low input turf. Low fertility needs, the um, fine fescue lawns require about one sixth the amount of nitrogen as compared to Kentucky bluegrass lawns. Um, I myself, I never fertilize my bee lawns, which are all planted with fine fescue. Um, the, the, the nitrogen requirement is just so low where it's just never needed them. Uh, fine fescue lawns have an incredibly slow rate of growth. Many folks, mow about once every 10 to 14 days. A fine fescue lawn, you could easily get away with mowing once every month or so, three to four times throughout a growing season. And they also have exceptional drought tolerance, where the University of Minnesota has what they call a rainout shelter, where they're able to manipulate how much water these areas receive. And they found that a fine fescue lawn can easily go three, even four plus weeks without receiving a natural rain event and still maintain its beautiful, pristine aesthetic. So really require much less water than a Kentucky bluegrass lawn. Uh, something else that I wanna highlight about the fine fescues is they have really great shade tolerance. All grasses do well in the sun for the most part, but it's a lot harder to find something that's gonna grow nicely near an oak tree or something like that where there's quite a bit of shade. So if you're trying to figure out what, what'll grow nicely in your shady areas, a uh, fine fescue is a great option for that. But now as this relates to bee lawns, so we've been thinking about low input turf in the turf grass world for 10, 20 years. What we don't think about quite as much is what grasses are going to do nicely when we want to uh, invite flowers to grow alongside them. Where now we have to think about turf grasses as competitors. Do they invite flowers in or are they going to crowd them out? So I'm trying to think about how competitive are different turf grass species. I'm thinking about their morphology and also their rate of growth. And I'll show you a little bit what I mean in this slide. So first, I want you all to look at what I would consider to be a highly competitive turf grass species, a turf grass that grows quick, has a thick leaf blade. What we would fear in this situation with a fast growing turf grass species is that it would crowd out the flowers we're trying to co-establish with it within a bee lawn, and that we would see low forb establishment. Those grasses would crowd out the flowers, form a canopy over them, the flowers would really struggle to establish. Um, the opposite of that is if we were to use turf grass species that have a slow rate of growth and a thin leaf blade, they don't require as many nutrients, there's more nutrients available for the flowers, and they're far less likely to form a canopy over the top of the flowers. When using these low input species, we expect high forb establishment. We expected lots of flowers to, to establish when we use these less competitive grasses. And this is something that Ian actually put into practice. He took the four most common turf grass species used in the northern climates of the United States, Kentucky bluegrass, a hard fescue, which is a type of fine fescue, tall fescue, and perennial ryegrass. And he asked the question, how will flowers grow in each of these grasses? So you'll notice that two of them have thin leaf blades and slow rates of growth. Two of them have wide leaf blades and fast rates of growth. And Ian's hypothesis was that the flowers would grow well with the Kentucky bluegrass and the hard fescue because they were because he thought they would be much less competitive for uh, because of the, the rate of growth and the leaf blade width. So he put this to practice and he found that his hypothesis was absolutely correct. When it came to the number of blooms within the lawns, those less competitive species, the fine fescues and the Kentucky bluegrass really did a much better job of inviting flowers in. He saw more than nine times the number of blooms in those low input species as compared, excuse me, in those slow growing thin leaf blade species 
as compared to the perennial ryegrass and the tall fescue, which really grow quite a bit faster and have thicker leaf blades. So ultimately, when choosing between fine fescues and Kentucky bluegrass as to which is the best species for a bee lawn, we, we recommend the fine, the fine fescues because they're low input, where they marry sustainability with inviting flowers into the landscape. So now that we know which turf grass species is best for, for a bee lawn, let's talk about which flowers work really nicely within the confines of a bee lawn. So selecting floral species, again, a lot of the work that Ian did on this project. So when Ian was trying to select flowers for bee lawns, there were a few boxes that we needed each of these flowers to check. One, we needed to make sure that they could tolerate lawn management practices. And that's just a way of saying, which flowers can survive a mowing event and continue to bloom thereafter? Where if we think of a mowing from a uh, flower's perspective, you're chopping off sometimes around one third or even half of my uh, vegetative body. That is a whole lot of stress for a plant to incur. There are lots of flowers that really don't respond well to it that can't continue to bloom after being mowed. So that was a major hurdle to try and work through. Um, of course, we wanted to only use flowers that provided high quality forage for our wild bees. Uh, here we're talking about the contents of the nectar and the uh, pollen, where we want nectar that's high in sugar content and pollen that's high in protein content. Those are really essential for bee health. And then also we wanted as best we can to try and incorporate native flowers into these bee lawns. This was something that ended up being uh, fairly challenging, but I'll talk a little bit more about some advancements that we've had on that front. So I want to talk about now each of the flowers that really did well in these trials, in our bee lawn trials, and that are now included in bee lawn mixes. Uh, the first that I'll talk about is self heal. This is, in my opinion, an incredibly beautiful flower. It's also a native flower. What you'll notice about this is it's got these medium and these medium to large sized world blooms. Something that I think is very unique about this flower, at least within the confines of a bee lawn, is the corolla or the floral neck of this flower, where it's quite a bit longer than that of the other species included in this mix. And where that plays a role is within the type of bees we expected to visit this flower. So a long floral neck, that generally means only bees with uh, large bodies and really long tongues, where in order to reach those floral rewards, you need a long tongue to get in there, scoop out that nectar, get the rewards from the flower. Um, in terms of where this flower can establish, it does well in both full to part sun, and it can even tolerate a little bit of moisture within the soil. So if you're trying to figure out, I've got this clay lawn, I don't know what's going to establish, self heal can actually do quite well in a clay soil that's, that retains a little bit of moisture. That being said, it does really well in a full sun sandy soil as well, but I know clay soils can be quite a challenge for gardeners. Uh, something that I didn't put in this slide, but it's important to take to keep in mind, is its bloom period. Something that's really important to me whenever I'm designing a landscape, whether it's a bee lawn or a solar array that's trying to plant acres of pollinator habitat, is having staggered bloom times. So this self-heal flower, it typically in the state of Minnesota, blooms in like the fourth week of June through the first or second week of August. So kind of a midsummer blooming species. The creeping time, at least from a pollinator's point of view, kind of functions like the exact opposite of the self-heal, where instead of having a larger bloom that's a little bit constricted to, due to that long corolla, it's got this really small, kind of almost wide open bloom. And this lends itself really nicely to smaller pollinators. Something that's really great about creeping time from a uh, gardener's point of view, especially gardeners like us in the uh, north central climate, is this species has great drought tolerance and winter hardiness. So last summer, I'm sure we're all very well aware that we had such incredibly low rainfall numbers. We had an extreme drought and creeping thyme actually thrived in those conditions. So when everyone's turf grass was going brown, the creeping thyme was blooming beautifully. Uh, that last, this last bullet point is kind of a little bit more of anecdotal than something that's backed by hard research. But I've heard from many a master gardener that creeping time is a natural deer deterrent, where deer do not like the scent and the taste associated with the vegetation of creeping time. So if you ever have a border where you're trying to figure out what can I plant here to deter deer, creeping time might be a really great option for those areas. Um, something that I love about creeping time is it's a late bloomer. I'll talk more about that, but late summer through the early fall, even the mid fall for creeping time. Um, and Dutch white clover, it's got these open kind of medium-sized blooms, lends itself well to a great diversity of pollinators. 
it also has really fantastic rewards. So both the pollen and the neck, excuse me, both the pollen and the nectar are extremely high quality. The pollen is very rich in protein. The nectar is very rich in sugars. Um, you heard me mention before that I never fertilize bee lawns. And the, real, and the reason for that, or at least part of the reason, is because Dutch white clover is included in the seed mix. Dutch white clover is a legume, meaning that it has is also a uh, nitrogen fixer. It takes that atmospheric nitrogen, brings it back into the soil. And because of that, and the very low nitrogen requirement of the grasses used in the bee lawn mix, we don't really need to apply any fertilizer to a bee lawn. The Dutch white clover is doing all that heavy lifting for you. So a species that's not included in the bee lawn mixes because it's so difficult to produce, um, but I recommend letting it grow within your bee lawns if it's naturally occurring or locally available to you, is common violet. So common violet, it's very hard to find in terms of seed, but it's naturally occurring in many lawns. Uh, this species blooms April through June. It does really well in sun or shade. It's extremely mobile and walkable. And what I really love about uh, common violet is the value it provides as a host plant. So it's not so much that pollinators are visiting and obtaining nectar and protein from it, but actually that there are some Lepidopteran species that lay its eggs on these on the vegetation of these flowers. Specifically, um, native skippers really like these plants for egg laying. So just a little food for thought, if you've got some common violet in your yard, lucky, lucky you, it's really great for a number of different pollinators. Um, here's just a beautiful picture of common violet naturalized in a lawn in Minneapolis, Minnesota. You can see that it comes in both a white and purple variety. And I mean, my personal two cents is I don't know how we ever became convinced that a green carpet is more beautiful than something bursting with color. So for me, this is much preferred than a traditional turf grass lawn. So something you might have noticed about the flowers that I mentioned is we do include some non-native species. So I kind of want to go outside my point of view where I'm very clearly biased and bring in some points of view from some experts in the field about the specific non-native species we use in these mixes. Where uh, Neil Samarja from the National Park Service is quoted as saying that Dutch white clover has been in the US for a long time and is more or less naturalized. I generally don't see it out competing native species. And what Neil really does here is he differentiates a non-native species from an invasive species where an invasive species has the potential to competitively exclude natives from an area. None of the non-natives included in our BLON mixes are invasive. They aren't competitive to the point where they're going to um, exclude native species, outcompete those beautiful natives in your adjacent gardens. Uh, the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum is quoted as saying, while non-native flowers may be aggressive, they can still be very useful. Dutch white clover, trifolium repens, and creeping thyme, thymus or phyllum are two species that benefit pollinators and will flower in a mowed lawn. So really it's that the benefits that these species provide so far outweigh any drawbacks there may be to not using um, a to, to any negatives there may, may be to a, the, the fact that they're non-native. Um, something that I also encourage folks to keep in mind is within the confines of a lawn, really all they're going to outcompete is turf grasses. And if I have a little bit more flowers and a little less grass, I, for one, am not going to be crying about it. And I hope that all of you would see the benefits in, um, in having these flowers instead of grasses. Um, yeah, so that kind of covers the flowers that work within these bee lawns. And now I wanna talk about who actually visits a bee lawn. So what pollinators are we actually supporting here? So with self-heal, I mentioned that we expected larger bees, some bumblebees, some megachylid bees, um, and we did see a bunch of them. They used their long bee tongues to reach in, grab those rewards. What we were not expecting was to see smaller bees. So here's a beautiful Osmia bee on the self heel. And the best way I can describe how smaller bees are able to use flowers with such a long corolla is it's unbelievably cute. So they actually crawl inside the floral neck, get their rewards and zoom out. I only know this because I spent hours upon hours on my hands and knees crawling, looking inside the blooms to observe what, what bees were on them. And I saw tons of these small osmia bees and other small bees using the self heal uh, and grabbing rewards from it. So something else that I noted is that self heal, we believed it was primarily a nectar source. What's really exciting is that we found some evidence that the self heal was also a source of protein. What I wanna do here is show you a quick little video of a bumblebee on self heal. So any of you that have observed bees, especially if you're a beekeeper, are probably very familiar with what's called combing behavior. It's when a hairy bee will use its arms to comb bee from their hairs down into their pollen sacs. 
And that means that they've got some pollen on them. They're trying to bring it into their pollen baskets. And what you'll see in this video is that this bumblebee is exhibiting that combing behavior. If you look at those front legs, you can see it comb, comb, combing like crazy, trying to bring that pollen down into its pollen sacs. And that was some evidence to us that this bumblebee is not strictly using this flower for nectar. Um, it's also using this as a source of protein. Um, something that I can't help myself but doing, uh, but do during one of these presentations is uh, we have a really great opportunity sir, for some impromptu bumblebee ID here. If you're looking at the abdomen and you see that W shape with the yellow on the abdomen, that is a textbook indicator of Bombus bimaculatus. So I know this isn't a bumblebee identification workshop, but I cannot resist and go into a little tiny, tiny bit of bumblebee ID there. So some important kind of bullet points about each of these species. So with the self heal, more than 95% of the bee visitors we observed on self heal were native species. So if you're looking for a, a, a floral species within the original bee lawn mix that really lends itself well to native pollinators, self heal is a great species for that. Um, these facts are brought to you courtesy of uh, Bailey the bee, the unofficial mascot of the Lawn Legumes program. I include her because she's cute. Um, so creeping time, a little bit about who we see and why this flower is important. So I mentioned the small open blooms that lend itself really well, nicely to smaller bees. Here's our friend Augo Chlorella again. We also saw a bunch of bees from the genus Laceoglossum. So lots of small sweat bees is who we saw on the creeping time. But what I think is really the most important thing about this creeping time flower is its bloom time. So something that I mentioned a few moments ago was this idea of having staggered bloom times within a planted area. So the fact that this species blooms between August and September in Minnesota, where there's really very few species in bloom, we think that is incredibly valuable. That within our own lawns, we can give our bees some forage before they start to overwinter. That was an incredible benefit that we saw from this flower. So Bailey, the bee's message here is that creeping time is the latest to bloom of all the bee lawn flowers. And finally, Dutch white clover. Here, the power within this species is simply the sheer diversity of visitors that we saw. Small to large size visitors, all sorts of different bee genera, families, you name it, where we see some beautiful agapostmen, some other gorgeous sweat bees. This is really just an excuse for me to show off beautiful bee pictures. Um, a beautiful Bombus rufosinctus. You could see those little orange patches on the bottom of its abdomen, and even some honeybees. So I know there's a little bit debate over honeybees and the role they play within our societies. My personal two cents is that pollinators are, excuse me, honeybees are these incredibly important pollinators that provide so much value to our uh, natural ecosystems as, as pollinators of our flowers, and of course, to our agricultural production. So even if they are more akin to livestock than they are wild pollinators, that doesn't mean that they don't provide ecosystem services. And the fact that we're seeing both honeybees and wild bees on this flower, I think it's a tremendous benefit. So clover is a critical source of forage for both honeybees and native bees alike. So in talking about the sheer diversity of bees that we saw on Dutch white clover, we saw more than 55 bee species using Dutch white clover as a source of forage in the bee lawn project in just Minneapolis. So my research was constricted to just Hennepin County, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we saw more than 10% of all of the bees in the entire state on this one flower. That's a number that absolutely blew us away. Uh, for the entire bee lawn mix, we saw more than 65 bee species which is more than 15% of all of the bees in Minnesota. When you consider that we were looking at just three species and we were confined to one small region of the state, we were absolutely blown away by the diversity of bees that we observed um, on our bee lawn mix. So that covers the original bee lawn mix. Something that I'm extremely excited about is one of the most common questions I received when doing these workshops as a student was, is it possible to develop an, a, a version of this mix that uses all native wildflowers. So keeping the grasses the same, but really placing an emphasis on our native uh, flowers. And recently I drew up a new mix, what we call our native bee lawn mix that uses all native wildflowers. So we keep the self heal, that's a beautiful native species. And we replace the Dutch white clover and the creeping thyme with common yarrow, or excuse me, yak yarrow and blue eyed grass. And I'll talk a little bit about those species here. 
But what I want you to keep in mind is that we're following this idea that native plants support native pollinators. Uh, this is a statement backed by millions of years of coevolutionary history. So a little bit about yak yarrow, sometimes also called Western yarrow. Um, in that previous slide, I accidentally put common yarrow. This is a very closely related subspecies of common yarrow. It's much less aggressive and it also blooms at a lower height. So first with the yak yarrow, it is very attractive to diverse groups of butterflies, uh, to, excuse me, diverse groups of pollinators. So we see bees on this flower, we see butters, butterflies on this flower, but where this species is really exceptional to me is with regards to sustainability. I'm all about trying to reduce our natural resource consum consumption within the confines of our lawns. And yak yarrow really thrives there, where um, NTEP, which is a turf grass research organization, they look at all different sorts of vegetation and how much water they require. And they found that this yak yarrow is the top performing uh, species under low input conditions. They found that in a trial conducted between 2015 and 2017. So if you're looking for a flowering species that one, provides food for our pollinators, and two, really thrives under low input conditions, yak yarrow is great there. One thing to keep in mind for both the yak yarrow and the blue-eyed grass, which I'll talk about now, is these species bloom a little bit taller than the species used in the original bee lawn mix. All of the flowers that are included in the original bee lawn mix bloom at three inches and lower. The blue-eyed grass and the yak yarrow, they bloom at six inches in height. So what I tell folks is for your traditional bee lawns, your original bee lawns rather, they bloom just below the ankle. For this native bee lawn mix, they bloom just above the ankle. So back to the blue-eyed grass. Don't let the name fool you. This is actually um, uh, very closely related to the irises you're all familiar with. And even though it's called blue-eyed grass, it is very much a forb, it is very much a flower. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me when I look at this flower is the colors, where blue and yellow are colors that are incredibly attractive to bees. Their visual spectrum is a little different from ours, where they don't pick up as well with reds, but they pick up on blues and violets much, much better than we do. They can even see the ultraviolet part of the visual spectrum. So the colors included in this flower are very attractive to our bees. We see all sorts of different bees, bumblebees, sweat bees, but also songbirds on blue-eyed grass, where songbirds actually like the seeds that come from the blue-eyed grass. Um, this species does have very nice shade tolerance and it can even thrive with some moisture. In fact, out of all of the bee lawn flowers, in terms of, uh, if you're asking yourself the question, when should I water my bee lawn? This species kind of serves as almost like the canary in the coal mine, where this is the first species that will start to show some um, heat stress when there's, when, when we don't get too much rain. So if you start to see your blue-eyed grass look a little uh, less pristine than you were hoping, that's a good indicator where, okay, now it's time to give my bee lawn a nice uh, dense watering. And again, this species also blooms at right around six inches. So what's really exciting is that these bee lawn mixes are uh, available to you. I know Twin City Seed, where I work for, makes them available, but the Blue Thumb website can point you to a number of partners that carry bee lawn mixes and can make them available to you. Um, if you're interested in any of these bee lawn mixes and want more info or want to know where you can grab them, you can reach out to me directly, jwolfin at twincityseed.com for more info there. And I highly encourage you to reach out with me with any questions, inquiries you have with regards to bee lawns. Um, I will never have a day where I turn folks away from any sorts of questions that they have. Um, another little note about bee lawns is the, um, a study was conducted in the Chicago area where they found that converting just 5% of a lawn to any form of pollinator friendly vegetation can improve local pollination. So something that I've been encouraged by some mentors to do is to try to break the choir, so to say, where instead of just giving messaging that's going to feed into like-minded people like myself, the folks that love pollinators and love sustainability, try and reach folks who maybe have some different goals, where I am yet to meet the person who does not love food. So if you're looking to support local food, local growers, converting just a little bit of your lawn to something that blooms, something that supports pollinators can really help yields at urban gardens and urban farms. So just a little bit of food for thought in that area. Yes, that pun was intentional. I gave it about a four out of 10, not my best work. So that covers kind of uh, how we actually make these bee lawns come to life, which species we use, uh, 
and the bees that we see visiting. Now what I want to talk about is installation and maintenance, how we can actually install these as a DIY project. I'm going to jump right into installation and maintenance. I'll talk through how we can go about first removing whatever existing planting we have, if necessary, a little bit on how we can replenish the soil, and also a little bit on the ongoing maintenance that's required. Um, a little teaser there with maintenance. Once you get these established, they are so easy to maintain. If you put your effort into installing these right, making sure that establishment is a success, the maintenance is going to be a breeze as compared to a traditional turf grass lawn. So first, let's talk about timing. What's really great is we are just now entering the perfect spring win win excuse me, the perfect spring window for installation, where a late winter, I'm sure it's not what we all had in mind. I think we all want to be at parks and breweries and whatever fun spring events we all have in mind. Uh, it's still winter here in Minnesota. I'm sure Michigan is still nice and chilly too, but it does mean that our planting season for uh, spring lawns is a little bit delayed. Where right now, I would say the first through third week of May is going to be an ideal time to plant lawns, bee lawns included, within the North Central United States. So in terms of when I would time these in the early spring, we wait a little bit after snow melt. Uh, we want those soil temperatures to heat up a little bit. The ideal soil temperature we're looking for is consistent soil temps above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you can find those with a Google search. If you don't want to do a Google search, kind of a loose approximation of that is whenever we start to get consistent ambient temperatures of 60 and above, highs of 60 and above, that generally means this is a good time to start planting lawns, bee lawns included. So what's great about a spring planting is our uh, flowers and our grasses are going to be able to compete with weedy species. So uh, you get them an early start, they're able to start accumulating what's called the green days, a fancy term that pretty much is just a measure of warmth, and they'll start to grow that very same year. So if you do a planting in the early spring, I would expect same year germination, where you would get some establishment and even limited and even some blooms from the bee lawn flowers. So definitely uh, the vegetation of the flower starting to grow, some blooms in that very first year, and progressively more blooms until you reach year two, year three, when these are fully established. Um, whenever you seed a lawn, unless you do it absolutely perfectly, there's bound to be a little bit of patchiness, maybe some bare spots. So I always recommend keeping a little bit of soil on hand for the uh, summer fall transition period for an overseeding to patch up those areas. Speaking of the summer fall transition window, that's the second window of time where I would recommend a bee lawn installation. So here what we're looking for is between August 15th and September 15th, uh, when our soil temperatures start to dip down, as they, the closer they get to 60 degrees, the better. Uh, so ambient temperatures between 60 and 75 degrees, soil temperatures right around 60 degrees. Here I would expect same year germination but only really mostly vegetation. So the plants will start to germinate, but they won't start to bloom until the following spring for the most part. Uh, if you want to do a little overseeding, you see some patchy areas as we start to exit that late summer window, uh, you can do a little bit more overseeding in the very late fall, almost the start of December in what we call the dormant seeding window. And now I'll talk about how we can install these during that very window, that dormant seeding window. So for my, the purposes of my research, I established all of my bee lawn plots in this dormant seeding window, and it was very successful. It's a window I highly recommend to folks, where for the purposes of a bee lawn, my two favorite times to install them are one, that early spring time period, and two, that late, the late fall time period as a dormant seeding. So with a dormant seeding, what we're looking for is um, soil temperatures right around 40 degrees. And what that'll do is it's too cold for the plants to start to germinate, but the ground is not yet frozen. So our seed is making contact with the soil bed. And as the name implies, the seed is going to lie dormant until the following spring. What's really great about this is as we start to get some, uh, some warm days here and there throughout the spring, our flowers that are getting ready to grow, getting ready to bloom, are going to be collecting those degree days, collecting that warmth, and they're going to do a really great job of sprouting and growing as soon as possible. And this will give them a little bit of a competitive advantage against whatever weeds might be in your soil bed. Um, if you do a dormant seeding, uh, wait through the spring, see how things come up, and then have a little bit of that extra seed on hand to, to uh, overseed into those patchy areas. 
Um, something that's very relevant to us in northern climates. Here in, Min in Minnesota, and I'm sure over in Michigan as well, we generally have snow cover throughout the entirety of winter. That's actually good for your bee lawns. It helps to ensure um, good establishment. It helps to keep the seed in place throughout the winter. So there are two methods that can be used to install a bee lawn. I have done both of these, done both of these successfully. There's just some little differences in how you do it. So you can install a bee lawn as an overseeding where you see directly into a pre-existing turf grass stand, or you can do these as a new lawn renovation. What I want you to keep in mind as you think about how am I gonna do this as a DIY project is what does my lawn look like? So an overseeding, which is admittedly a little bit easier, is best suited for lawns that are planted with either Kentucky bluegrass or fine fescue. So here we're thinking back to Ian Lane's research as to which grasses work for a bee lawn, where they work best in Kentucky bluegrass or fine fescue lawns. And you also wanna have relatively low weed presence. So a little bit of weediness is fine, but if your lawn's really overtaken with weeds, the flowers in this mix are going to struggle to outcompete those weeds, especially a species that's highly competitive, like a creeping Charlie, perhaps. So let's say you don't have Kentucky bluegrass or fine fescue, you've got some other turf grass species, or you've got heavy weed infiltrations. The next option for you is to do this as a new lawn renovation, where you tear out the turf grass and you just start from scratch or you tear out whatever vegetation you have and you start from scratch. So let's talk about how to do this as an overseeding, where this is really quite easy. Uh, have, I've had tons of success. I've done one of these in like 30 minutes or less, the entire process. So step one is you mow the lawn as short as possible. Um, as you mow, you either wanna bag the clippings or rake them away. And as you either bag or rake the clippings, the total goal behind steps one and two is to expose as much soil as possible. Something that's important to remember as we put our gardening caps on, our planting caps on, is that seeds only germinate when they make contact with the soil bed. So by doing that mow, raking away those clippings, we're exposing more soil, we're making it so much easier for that seed to make direct contact with the soil. So after steps one and two, we are ready to spread the seed. Uh, here, lots of folks will top dress as they spread the seed. When I, when I say top dress, I mean they include some soil amendment along with their seed compost, a little bit of sand, sometimes what we call engineered soil, which is a mix of compost and sand, um, just to help with the germination process. After that, you're going to want to do one heavy watering. And after that one heavy watering, which is applied the day of seeding, you're going to want to implement what's called a light and frequent watering schedule. This is the same watering schedule that's used for the establishment of any turf grass lawn. And we do the same thing for one of these bee lawns where you just wanna keep the very uppermost layer of the soil moist. You're watering two to three times a day, but very light waterings. You're just getting the very top layer of the soil wet. Um, a few little tips on maintenance. I'll touch more on this later on, but you never again want to mow below three inches for the, for the excuse me, for the original bee lawn mix. Um, the flowers start to bloom at three inches. And if we wanna make sure that we have flowers at all times, we don't wanna to, to, to mow these things below three inches. Um, there's two mowing regimes that I recommend, either letting your bee lawn grow out to four and a half inches and cutting back to three, or letting your bee lawn grow out to six to seven and a half inches and cutting back to whatever the highest setting on your lawn mower is. That's very often four or four and a quarter inches. Um, what we're trying to do here is follow as best we can what's called the rule of one third in turf grass science where we wanna try not to mow more than one third of the total height of our lawn. So four and a half inches down to three inches or six, uh, or six inches down to four inches, up to seven inches down to four inches is your best bet. Um, and also I hope this last point is obvious to you, but it never hurts to, to throw a reminder in there. Please, please, please try to not use herbicides on these uh, flowering lawns. These herbicides will unfortunately kill those flowers. You just worked so hard to get in the ground. So I think it's important to remember that, to recognize that not all of you will have these pristine, perfect uh, growing conditions to put your bee lawns into. So with that being the case, I recommend that you start from scratch where you tear away those that turf grass and you can plant your bee lawn seed mix directly into that bare ground. So while this is a little bit more work or sometimes even a little bit more money to kind of accomplish this, uh, I do expect a little bit more consistent, maybe even improved overall results. The reason for that is 
You don't have to worry at all as to whether or not your seed is making contact with the soil bed. If you rip out that vegetation, you're making direct contact. So how to remove that vegetation, how to remove that turf, those weeds, whatever it is you're trying to combat. I'm gonna talk through a number of different strategies from the more conventional to the cutting edge. Yes, I know I'm back at it again with the puns. So if you're doing a really small area, I would recommend using either a shovel or better yet, a sod kicker. What a sod kicker is, is it's this blade that runs underneath the turf grass and it tears it out. If you look behind this gentleman from the conservation corpse, you could see that as he runs the sod kicker through the lawn, it's ripping away that turf real easily and leaving behind bare soil to plant into. Um, pretty much any equipment rental uh, business that's nearby in Michigan. I know the ones in Minnesota, I'll admit that my knowledge of local Michigan businesses is not that great having never lived there. But a sod kicker can be found most any equipment rental place and it will save you so much time uh, in the work you're doing. I know for, for me locally, I've used these myself with neighbors. It costs like 15 bucks to rent it for the day. And believe me, your back and body will thank you with how much time and work it's going to save you. So those work really well for smaller projects. If you're doing a larger project, I recommend a little bit of uh, heavier equipment for a new lawn renovation, where I'd highly recommend either renting a sod cutter or what we call a mini excavator, or sometimes a dingo for these projects where, yeah, there's a little bit of an upfront cost, but it's gonna save you so much time and energy in the long run through your projects. So I would say once we surpass like 250, certainly once we surpass like 500 square feet, I tend to, to recommend folks use a sod cutter or a dingo instead. So those are kind of some hand methods, some mechanical methods that you could use to uh, convert your lawn. What's becoming increasingly popular is using organic site preparation methods. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna give a brief overview of some organic site preparation methods that are recommended by the Xerxes Society, but I highly recommend checking out the Xerxes Society's Guide to Organic Site Preparation if you want a little bit more info on either of these organic site prep methods or some of the other methods that they recommend. So a solarization, what we're doing here is we're laying some plastic over whatever vegetation we're trying to convert. And what that plastic does is it's going to collect heat. The area that the underneath the plastic is going to be like a mini oven. It collects heat over time, and it slowly but surely kills whatever vegetation is underneath. For these, you want to let them go. If you put down your uh, solarization uh, plastic now, you're going to want to leave them for a solid three or four months until we hit you know, the summer fall transition window, August, September, maybe even October before you tear it away and uh, get ready to do your seeding. Uh, what some folks do recommend for this is adding a little bit of a soil amendment as doing the solarization. We're not sure how it interacts with the microorganisms within the soil. So adding in a little bit of compost, something that helps to, um, to bring some food to those microorganisms is recommended. The second option that I would consider for you is a sheet mulching. Some of you may be familiar with this, but I'll give a brief overview as anyways. Um, I sometimes affectionately call a sheet mulching lawn lasagna, where what you're doing is you're putting down layers of compost and cardboard and giving them these really deep soaks in between. Those soaks are gonna help the uh, your layers kind of pack in nicely and ensure that you have nice dense coverage throughout the area that you wish to convert. So that compost, that cardboard, it's going to break down, it's going to be rich in organic matter, and it's going to be a really nice fluffy soil eventually to plant into. So again, these are just very brief overviews of a solarization and a sheet mulching, but they are some really great organic site preparation methods to at least consider if you're going to do a lawn renovation. So believe it or not, there's actually a little bit of science between uh, behind how you actually seed a lawn. Where what we recommend is what we call a perpendicular seeding, where you spread half of your seeding, uh, half of your seed walking in the north-south direction, you spread half of the seed walking in the east-west direction. So let's say you've got a thousand square feet, you've got five pounds of seed for, to cover that 1,000 square feet, you're spreading two and a half pounds walking north-south, you're spreading the remaining two and a half pounds walking east-west. Um, after you put the seed down, you're going to want to do a light rake. Your goal here is not to submerge the seed, but to just get a light covering of the seed with just a little bit of soil. This will help it establish. 
So again, implementing that light and frequent watering program, you're going to do one heavy watering and then implement what's called a light and frequent watering pro program. At the bare minimum, try and make sure these get some water three times per week. I would recommend doing like a quarter inch of water throughout the lawn two to three times per day. In total, it's not that much water and it will really help your lawn get established. But uh, what I always tell folks to remember is that yes, these are low input, but we need to make sure they get established. So really make sure you do your work on the front end the first 30 days ago to get these established with that light and frequent watering program. And then for the remaining years into the future, you can cut back on all those lawn inputs. So an installation example here, step one, you remove that turf by hand, mean, or some, excuse me, hand machine or some cultural method. Step two, I recommend top dressing, add a little bit of compost, a little bit of soil and raking it up a little bit. So raking it up, raking these areas will help to reduce soil compaction. It'll help to kind of uh, just make the area more amenable for planting. So then you spread that seed in and you do another light raking to make sure that the seed can get settled. Remember, don't submerge. After that, the, the steps are just the same as for an overseeding where you keep the area moist with that light and frequent watering schedule. And again, for maintenance, never again mow below three inches, uh, a light trim in the fall as we head into overwinter. And please, please, please refrain from using herbicides within these bee lawns. So as you um, get ready to install these, you might not remember every single detail from this presentation. This slide right here is like a nice little cut sheet as you try to decide, should I do an overseeding? Should I do a new lawn renovation? Covering which conditions are suitable for each, what goes into each of the seed mixes for an overseeding versus a new lawn renovation, um, and also the benefits associated with each. Where it is possible to buy a bee lawn mix with just the wildflowers, where if you have turf grass that is suitable for um, a bee lawn as is, you might not need to get a bee lawn mix with the turf grass included. You could buy just the wildflowers and spread them as you see fit. Uh, that being said, I always recommend folks switch over to a fine fescue lawn if they don't have one already for the sheer goal of sustainability, reducing lawn inputs, uh, less mowing, less watering, less uh, less ir less mowing, less watering, and less fertilizer, excuse me, where um, even if that doesn't help the pollinators directly, it is great for our environment. So a little bit on ongoing maintenance, and I am all about giving folks maintenance tools. The reason I only talk about this a little bit is because these are so easy to maintain. So uh, getting these established is really the... Um, the big deal here, where the first 30 days you're going to do a little bit of work and then it lessens dramatically from there. So the most important part is that step in bold, water frequently during establishment, that light and frequent watering schedule. After you get out of those first 30 days, you're going to water a little bit more than you typically would when these are mature, once at most twice per week. If we get natural rainfall, uh, Mother, Mother Earth is doing the work for you. Mother Nature, excuse me, is doing the work for you. Um, and even considering doing some light weedings while these are getting established, if you see something aggressive like a creeping Charlie or a broadleaf plantain starting to pop up, you might want to consider digging those out with a dandelion popper or some tool, a garden trowel, just to make sure that your flowers have some space to get in there. Um, mowing. Mowing is very important. And what we're trying to do here is make more sustainable lawns. Mow as infrequently as possible. That's at least my goal here. So there are a couple, so there are two mowing regimes that I recommend to folks. Uh, the first, if you want to have something that looks a little bit more traditional, especially if you're working with the original bee lawn mix, letting your lawn area grow to about four and a half inches and cutting it back to three will be right in line with, you know, the keeping up with the Joneses, staying in line with the neighbors, and you'll have flowers blooming throughout the growing season. If you don't mind letting things go a little bit more wild, observing a few more blooms along the way, I recommend letting your grass grow out a little bit longer, somewhere between six and seven and a half inches, especially if you're using the native bee lawn mix, and then mowing down to whatever the highest setting is on your uh, mower. Um, there's some really great research out of UMass Amherst where they found that letting your lawns grow longer results in more flowers within the lawn area. And for us that are trying to conserve pollinators, that is a major, major benefit. Uh, fertilizer. Me personally, I never fertilize bee lawns. I would say if you see your lawn starting to go brown and you know for a fact it's not due to irrigation, 
consider hitting it with a very, very light fertilizer application. I'd even recommend getting a soil test before doing that uh, fertilizer application. Um, irrigation. Once these are established, they need very, very little water. For the, for the purposes of my research, once they were established, I never once applied water and I had beautiful belongs throughout the entire duration of my master's project. What I will say is if we go three or four weeks without a natural rain event, you can consider hitting these areas with an inch or so of water just to make sure they stay nice and, and you know, aesthetically pleasing, nice and uh, pristine to the eye. So thatch removal. Here, this can be something that can be very useful, especially before a seeding event. If you know for your for a fact that your lawn is extremely dense, this can really be the case with a fine fescue lawn, you might want to consider a thatch removal before you do your seeding. Um, thatch is the layer of dead vegetation between your plants and your soil. So as that, that, build, as that thatch builds up, it can make it more difficult for your, um, for your seed to make contact with the soil bed. So if you know you've got this super dense lawn and you think you might have some thatch buildup, consider doing a thatch removal using a dethatcher before getting the before your seeding event. So that's all I've got for you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. 